here in the power of Christ, I will stand. Let's pray and ask God's blessing upon our consideration of his truth together this morning. Heavenly Father, we would pray that by your omnipotent grace, and by the effectual working of your Holy Spirit, That you will use this piece of clay that tries to preach today. And open ears and minds and hearts and wills and lives to the truth that is truly true. And we pray that you will light a fire within us for the gospel of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Today, from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10, I'd like to preach to you on the topic of reformed? Question mark. On occasion... I have heard or heard about those who speak disparagingly about churches, pastors, and Christians being reformed. The more radical voices even say, reformed theology is the bane of the evangelical church. I actually heard about a preacher who said in his sermon that the doctrines of theology that form the Reformed view are from the pit of hell. So today, I want to do a number of things. I certainly want to explain to you what Reformed theology is all about. And why our church is unashamedly reformed. I hope that if you don't believe in reformed theology. You will at least be challenged to think about your position today. From Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 through 10. We have referenced everything I want to talk about this morning. As we talk about reformed theology. Again, having read this passage earlier. The text says in verse 8 of Ephesians 2. By grace you have been saved through faith. The verb have been is a verb that means The result of this action cannot stop. In the perfect tense, it is a stated reality that is undeniable and cannot end. Therefore, you cannot fall from grace. By God's grace, you have been saved through faith. Now, the ESV puts a period there. And then states, and this is not your own doing. The question is, what is the antecedent of the word this? Is it grace? This is not of your own doing. It's by grace. Or is it faith? That faith is not your own doing. Well, the rest of the sentence in verse 8 says, It is the gift of God. Grammatically, theologically, and exegetically, it seems rather specific that the reference of this statement has to do with faith. This faith is not your own 
doing. It, your faith, is the gift of God demonstrating His grace. So that throws out, I can believe anytime I want to. No, you can't. God has to give you that gift. Verse 9. Not as a result of works. There you are again. Not as a result of works. So that no one may what? Boast. If, if I contributed to my salvation or saved myself, I would boast about it. So works do not save. God's grace through His gift of faith saves. Verse 10. For we are His workmanship. We. Who are we? Those who by grace have been saved. Those who've received the gift of faith. We are His workmanship. The word is poema. It means that which is designed and crafted by God. Verse 10 says, created in Christ Jesus for good works. So we do good works not to be saved, but because we're saved. For good works which God prepared before him that we should walk in them. That is the sum and substance of my sermon today. And let me begin by reminding us of the five parts that are found in this text that form the core of Reformed theology. They are, and I'm going to say them quickly, and then we'll back up and unpack them before we apply and press the point. These five parts found in this text and throughout the New Testament that form reform theology regarding the gospel of Jesus Christ is grace alone, faith alone, Christ alone, scriptures alone, to the glory of God alone. I think you've heard that this morning already. This forms the core and essence of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Therefore, Reformed theology is about the gospel of Christ. Let me just say marginally. Reformed churches can be found in many denominations. Reformed theology is not a denomination. You can find reformed theology in churches with, which have different governments and have different views on various secondary doctrinal issues such as baptism. But in every reformed church you will find this conviction that we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, as taught in the scriptures alone, to the glory of God alone. Now let's unpack it. First, grace alone. What does this teaching mean when it says we are saved by grace alone? Well, it means we deny certain things. We deny, according to the scripture, that salvation is by human effort or works. You cannot, you will not want to save yourself, nor can you save yourself, because saving oneself by works is impossible. Nor, and we deny again, that any part of salvation, any part of our salvation in our hearts and souls and lives can be caused by anything other than God's saving grace. From beginning to end, we affirm that we are saved, we are sinners saved by grace, and that means that we are saved by grace in every aspect of our Christian lives. For example, God saves us by grace by electing us unto salvation before the foundation of the world. We are saved by grace because God the Father sent God the Son to the cross to die for our sins and to place our guilt upon Him. And by imputation, He died for us and paid the price for our sin that we might be justified in His sight by grace. That God through His Spirit comes into our hearts and lives and cause a new birth and transform us. Not because we ask for it, not because we faith it, not because we want it, not because we 
promised to do better. But God, through His free, sovereign grace, sends His Spirit into our hearts and causes us to repent and causes us to believe, else we could not believe and repent. We believe and affirm that being saved by God's grace means God keeps us saved in sanctification by His grace. That there is no time in life when God's grace will ever end but will hold us until the day of our death. And grace will take us to heaven. We believe that grace includes Jesus' intercession for us at the throne of grace right now where Jesus Christ pleads the merits of His atoning work on the cross for us. And that is the only reason we're acceptable to God. But because of imputed righteousness which He's given to us, we are righteous before God. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, the scripture says. But according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. Titus 3.5. Grace alone. Second, faith alone. We deny that faith is a human work. We deny that sinners can express faith in and of themselves. We deny that faith is a good work. We deny that faith is inherently within us. We deny that sinners want to repent. We deny that sinners can repent. We deny that sinners can believe in Christ. We affirm that God, according to the teaching of our text and the entire New Testament, God gives saving faith to sinners as a gift. And that we receive saving faith from God as a gift. And that saving faith continues throughout our lives. It is not momentary, but continual throughout our lives. We confess and affirm that saving faith is purified through trials and sanctification. But it grows and strengthens throughout our lives. We affirm that saving faith is completed in heaven. We affirm that faith is to God's glory and to God's credit. That is why Romans 1.17 says, The righteous shall live by faith. Grace alone. Faith alone. In Christ alone. We're saved by God's grace alone. Through faith alone. In Christ alone. In Christ alone. Thus we deny. That Christ is only one way to God. We deny that Christ is only one way to salvation. We deny that there are other ways to God other than Jesus Christ. We deny that Christ is not the true way to God. But rather we affirm that Jesus Christ is the one and only Savior of sinners. We affirm that Jesus' death on the cross fully and completely atones for the sins of all who believe in Him. We affirm that Jesus rose from the dead truly and really and is the giver of life to all who look to Him in faith. We believe the Word of God when it says there is salvation in no one else. There is no other name given under heaven whereby we must be saved in the Lord Jesus Christ, Acts 4.12. We confess the scripture which says there's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, 1 Timothy 2.5. We confess what Jesus says in John 14.6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. We're saved by God's grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Number four, as taught in the scriptures alone. The scriptures alone. We deny that God speaks in any other way in the post-apostolic era except through the Scriptures. We deny that there is any other authority for doctrine and faith and life except what is taught in the Word of God, the Bible. We deny that any human subjective experience since the apostles is used by God to speak with authority and power. We affirm that God's Word is the Bible. We affirm that the Bible is the collection of 66 books of the canon of Scripture. We affirm that there is a consistency between Old and New Testaments centered on God's redemptive work finished in the person and saving work of Jesus Christ. We affirm that the Bible is inerrant, authoritative, all-sufficient, and clear and understandable through the illumination of the Holy Spirit. 
We confess the word of God when it says all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness so that the man of God may be adequately equipped for every good work. We confess the scripture when it says, For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing as far as division of soul and spirit. And we confess, as the scripture says, we must not add to the scripture or take away from it. It is the word of God. Thus we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, as taught in the scripture alone. And five... To the glory of God alone. We deny that God gives his glory to any other person or to a group of people. But he acts redemptively in people and for the salvation of the world for his own glory. We deny that we should see salvation as a work of the human heart and thus give glory to humans. We deny that the hope of the world is found in human ideology and philosophy and these things that we see in our day. We believe and confess that our hope is now and forever found in God alone through the saving work of Christ. To Him be the glory forever. We affirm that God saves sinners gloriously for his own glory. We affirm that Christians should praise God alone for the salvation they have in Christ. We affirm that God alone deserves the credit for saving us. We affirm that the hope of the world resides in the power and saving work of God, which gives him all the glory. We affirm as God's people, one day the entire world will be transformed into God's kingdom Accomplished by his free and sovereign work and grace through Christ for his own glory. Isaiah 42, the Lord speaking. I am the Lord, that is my name. I will not give my glory to another or my praise to graven images. Again, in that same book, the very next chapter, he says, I, even I am the Lord and there is no savior besides me. I am the Lord, your Holy One. These five concepts are central. They are core. They are foundational to the very gospel itself. This is Reformed theology. And how should we handle these five truths? May, may I suggest three ways that we should take them and use them and apply them. First, integration. We must see these truths as integrated together, not one set apart from the others. But all five go together. We're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, taught in the scriptures alone, to the glory of God alone. Integration. Second, elevation. We should elevate these truths in our teaching and preaching. We should not be ashamed of them. We should proclaim them from the housetops that all may hear these glorious truths as truths of God. Third, demonstration. We must demonstrate our commitment to Christ by our commitment to these truths. No matter what the cost. I think there's always been a challenge and an opposition to those who would hold to the faith of Jesus Christ. Certainly years ago. In 1521. An Augustinian monk. Named Luther. Martin. Luther. Who was getting in trouble. With the church. Because he believed what I just talked about. He was called to a court in a place called Worms, Germany. Now, it's, if you see the word, it's W-O-R-M-S. And a court in those days was called a diet. And so it looks a little weird to speak of the diet of Worms. Or the Diet of Worms, as it's pronounced in Germany. In German. He was called to account before the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, 
and by the Pope's own selected theologian to test him and to try to get him to recant these glorious truths. They brought him in and they laid out his books and they first said, are these your books? And he looked at them and he said, yes, they are. And then they said, will you recant without qualification? He stood there for a while and did not speak. And then he said something, but he could not be heard. It was so low in tone. He said, what did you say? He said, may I have 24 hours to consider that? And they granted that to him. He got 24 more hours. The next day he would be called to give answer. That night. In his room. He wrote down a prayer. And this is what he prayed. Almighty eternal God. How dreadful is the world. Behold how its mouth opens to swallow me up. And how small is my faith in you. The work is not mine but yours. I have no business here of my own. I have nothing to contend for with these great men of the world. I would gladly pass my days in happiness and peace. But the cause is yours my Lord. And it is righteous and it is everlasting. Stand by me. O oh, faithful and unchangeable God. I lean not upon man for it would be vain. You have chosen me for this work. I know it. Therefore, O oh God, accomplish your will. Stand by me in the name of Jesus Christ, who will be my shelter and my shield. Yes, my mighty fortress. He wrote a song entitled, what? A mighty fortress is our God. Yes, my mighty fortress through the might and strengthening of the Holy Spirit. I am now ready. To lay down my life for this cause. Patient as a little lamb. For the cause is holy. It is your own. And though this world be filled with devils. And though my body. The creation of your hands goes to destruction for this cause. And though it be shattered into pieces. Your word and your spirit are still good to me. The soul is yours. It belongs to you. And will also remain with you forever. God help me. The next day he appeared before the prelates. Again. Challenged to recant the gospel of Jesus Christ. Or. Be threatened. With death. And this was his reply. The next day. Unless I am convicted by scripture and plain reason. I do not accept the authority of popes and councils. For they have often contradicted each other. My conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot. And I will not recant anything. For to go against conscience is neither right nor safe. Here I stand. I can do. No. I cannot do otherwise. So help me God. By the, by the way the story is very interesting. How they got him away from Worms Germany. After that. That diet con concluded. Not long ago my wife and I. Had the opportunity to be in Worms Germany. And we were taken to a grassy area. And we were told this on this grass. Is where the building stood. Where this great reformer. 
confess the gospel of Jesus Christ. And on the grass, there were two brass oversized shoes. And she said, how would you have answered if you were in his shoes so long ago? And then she made an offer. How many of you would like to stand in the shoes of Martin Luther? What do you think I did? We have a picture of me standing in those shoes. That was a moving moment for me. It was a reminder that to stand for Christ will mean we'll pay a price. So many times, brothers and sisters, and my heart aches in saying this, we live our lives as if the gospel doesn't matter. We go to church when we want. We show up when we want. We hardly do anything for Jesus. But I believe with all of my heart that we are living in a day of beginning apostasy in the churches. And it will require many like him and Calvin and Zwingli and Beza and John Knox. Who will stand to say, we stand with scripture we stand with the gospel of Christ as taught in the New Testament. This will take resolve. It, this will take determination. We must fight against cowardice in this day that God would use us. Would we say with Anne Steele, who so many years ago in the 18th century wrote this poem and said, I would resolve with all my heart, with all my powers to serve the Lord, nor from his precepts e'er depart, whose service is rich reward. Oh, be his service all my joy, around let my example shine, till others love the blessed employ, and join in labors so divine. Be this the purpose of my soul, my solemn, my determined choice to yield to his supreme control and in his kind commands rejoice. Oh, may I never faint nor tire, nor wandering leave his sacred ways. Great God, accept my soul's desire and give me strength to live thy praise. Who will join with us to stand in the hour of this need? It may be a difficult path, but it's a good one. And it leads to the very throne of God where we share the glory of Christ together. May God help us not to be af afraid or ashamed of reformed theology. For it is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Christ. Let us pray together. Heavenly Father, we do not follow in the fashions of the latest church ideas, nor do we walk in the unstable path of cultural sensibilities and pagan ideology. We stand with you. We are determined. And yet. We do not depend. Upon our own human strength. To stay determined. For we know our own hearts. We will crumble under pressure. We will cave in. Against opposition. We've seen it far too many times. In our own lives. And so we pray that you would give us strength 
to be Bible people, Jesus people, gospel people, grace people. A people who seek love and desire your glory more than anything else in this world. May it be that you would strengthen us for this task. And help us to support churches that believe these things. Help us to support preachers who try to preach these things. And help us to try to live these things in our lives. In Christ's name we pray.